Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation. The government of India's efforts to bring an end to the Naga insurgency in the northeast of the country seems to have hit a major roadblock. When the National Socialist Council of Naga Lim or the NSENIM signed the framework agreement with the government of India in the presence of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in August 2015, there were high hopes for an early resolution of one of South Asia's long-lasting armed conflicts. New Delhi and the Modi government at that time made tall claims about the framework agreement and the imminent resolution of the Naga insurgency. And yet, it has not told us anything about the contents of the framework agreement of 2015. If it has already signed it, why not make it public? One wonders. It appears that the talks have hit a major roadblock over the issue of a separate flag and constitution for the Nagas, besides other local issues. Has the Modi government's decision to read down the provisions of Article 370 in August this year adversely affected the Naga peace process? Kashmir's special status was removed by the Modi government with the slogan, One Nation, One Constitution. This, on the one hand, may have now bound the hands of the central government in offering a deal to the Naga insurgents. How can you take away J and K's separate constitution and flag and then offer such a special provision to the Nagas? On the other hand, the unceremonious reading down of Article 370 by keeping the Kashmir Valley under military lockdown and its political leaders under house arrest may have cautioned the Nagas who were negotiating with the Indian interlocutor, Mr. R. N. Revi. Earlier this year, the NSC and chairman wrote to the Prime Minister, this is in reference to the core issues like Naga flag and the constitution which are yet to be agreed upon by the two parties. Without these two core issues resolved, any solution would be far from honourable because Naga pride and identity is deeply entrenched here. However, just last month, the government of India ruled out a separate flag and a separate constitution for the Nagas as demanded by the NSE and IM and made it clear that the endless negotiations with the insurgent group under the shadow of guns is not acceptable. So, where do we go from here now? What happens to the framework agreement that was signed between the Nagas and the government of India in 2015? Or for that matter, what was in that agreement? My guest today is Gopal Krishna Pillai. J.K. Pillai is a former Union Home Secretary and a former member National Security Advisory Board Government of India. He is currently the chairman of the Data Security Council of India. Mr. Pillai, welcome to the show. Could we begin this discussion with uh, the fundamentals? What is the Naga question? How old is the Naga question? What are the fundamental issues, core issues involved in this, in this sort of Naga question or the Naga insurgency as it were? This concept of uh, what I call as uh, Naga nationalism, which is a very uh, unique uh, concept has just come in the 20th century because if you see the first memorandum to the Simon Commission and I would like to just quote sure. from one just one paragraph it says and this is a memorandum to the Simon Commission 1929 where they say our country within the administered area consists of eight tribes quite different from one another with quite different languages which cannot be understood by each other and there are more tribes outside the administered area which are not known to us. We have no unity among us and it is only the British government that is holding us together. Interesting. In 1929, uh, uh, this is the uh, concept and then you see how so rapidly uh, this Naga nationalism spread literally like wildfire and I, I would put it as uh, Fizo is possibly the, in that sense, the father of the Naga nation if you want to call it is and it his so. pioneering groundwork among all the tribes brought in one sense uh, when British were leaving, uh, they felt that they needed and they first asked for, in fact, they initially they even asked for give us an autonomous uh, position in the state of Assam mm -hmm. with freedom to do what we would like to do, which subsequently then became a call for independence in 1946 and then in 47 they unilaterally declared uh, independence. Of course, they also talk about a plebiscite right. in 1951 where they say 99.9% .9 of, of the Naga population took part, which is obviously not correct because uh, majority of the Naga tribes uh, did not even know 
those who were in Manipur, those who were in the Tuansang area, etc., they were not part of the Naga Hill districts. They never even knew that the plebiscite was taking place. This is all only in the Naga Hill district. But it is something which has caught and its perceptions are so important. It has caught the imagination of uh, the population of what the Naga tribes, um, what you would call as 16 tribes and now much more uh, tribes which have come and across the border uh, in Myanmar also there are Naga tribes who also right. now got this little bit of uh, this feeling of that we are Nagas. Thank you for that excellent sort of overview and picture that you've drawn for us. What has been the government of India's response since uh, independence towards the Naga insurgency as it were? See, I think you have to understand. And what strategies and tools were used? See, in the time of partition, and I think it's important to understand the historical context, uh, the, co the attention of the government of India was pr primarily on in the Punjab and Kashmir. That was where the focus of everything was taking place. Yeah, of course, and it was Hyderabad and all of that. But that was, all those which are yeah. coming separately. Yeah. The Nagas, you must realize, the population in 1947 was 2.14 lakhs. So, okay. in, a, in a country of that time of so many millions, 2.14 lakh uh, is an insignificant, right. insignificant uh, it's a very small number. Very small number. Right. So, and we knew very little. I think the government of India knew very little about not just Nagas, but you know, about uh, Maithis, the Manipur. Tripura and so on. We knew very little about those those areas except a little bit of in Assam. Correct. So uh, I think they just you know they treated it like you know you are what is 2.14 lakh people asking for a country? You know it sort of somebody would not they would not even have looked you know it would have been just brushed aside just. I know, just asking something, you know, it's not a... No, but besides ignoring that question of the Naga sovereign statehood, as it were, what were the other tools and strategies that the government of India used to deal with the Naga question, as it were, or the Naga quest, as it were? The very interesting aspect that in the, t in the initial years, right up to the 60s, the entire Naga issue because of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru's keen interest in this, Varier Elvin and the Northeast, you know, the tribal policy, uh, the Naga issue was actually dealt with by the Ministry of External Affairs and not by the Ministry of Home Affairs. Well, that is interesting. So, uh, all the negotiations, there was a director Naga in the Ministry of External Affairs, the Foreign Secretary, you know, the most famous whom was uh, Gundevia, who conducted all oh, the yes, negotiations Gundavia. during Jay Prakash Narayan yes. uh, and so on, was all done by the Foreign Secretary. So, it sort of gave it. What was the logic behind that? It is just because that NIFA, NIFA was right. uh, part of, uh, you know, the uh, Nehru kept Northeast Frontier Agency, it was part of it, it just remained. And only late 60s, 69, 70, I think the realization dawned in the government of India that this is an internal issue, not a <laughs> something for the foreign <laughs> ministry to be dealing with it. And then the entire thing was shifted, uh, I think late 69, 70, when Indira Gandhi had come and so on, that time all the files uh, were shifted. So, so when, when and how the uh, did the peace process uh, begin to shape, uh, take shape in in, in the northeast, in the, in the, as far as the Naga question is concerned? See, it started with a uh, you know the initial round of you would you would have talked about the the governor of Assam and his nine point agreement, Hyderi with the uh, nine point agreement, on which there was again a di misinterpretation or difference of views of what he meant when he said after ten years. Uh, you know, the Nagas can make up their mind. Uh, the Nagas felt that they would have the option of independence after 10 years and we, government of India felt that all it meant was after 10 years we can negotiate uh, how you would stay within India. And that's how the nine point agreement was then literally disowned by the government of India. Then you had a whole series of negotiations which took place again. Uh, Is it, isn't, there a, isn't there a similarity about the the plebiscite in Kashmir um, and the nine point agreement uh, yes, that was there offered is. to. There is what, a what is the similarity and how do similarity you. Similarity is that because after 10 years they said the Naga people will choose. Right. Uh, you know what what was meant. Whereas we actually meant well, what they will choose is you know it's a, like you had in Kashmir you had a separate you could have a you know different you could have a special status hmm. but uh, you would still be part of India and they, right. they felt that option of independence was still there. So, they felt cheated. They felt, yeah, they felt that uh, the, and then government of India, I think very quickly realized that there is too much open, openness in the agreement, it could be misinterpreted both ways. 
the Hyderi agreement was more or less, uh, you know, disowned by the government and uh, uh, people in Assam and so on. And then the negotiation started. You had this insurgency. Army came in in 1956, and then there were a lot of uh, what shall I say, civil society, uh, the Naga, um, um, the elite, and the civil society, society etc. They said, said, "We want talks." And there was a lot of talks between them and the officers of the Indian Frontier Administrative Service, like Dr. Ramani Menon and others, who then came up with this what we call as the 16-point agreement, and which formed the state of Nagaland. And in hindsight, I think the big mistake government made was giving them a statehood in 1960. Why do you say because that? Because under the Indian Constitution, there is nothing more that you can give than a state. That's right. And you had all these negotiations with the civil society, keeping out the armed cadres who were fighting. Mm. So when you had the agreement, you gave the statehood for a population of that time 60 of 3.47 lakhs. And I still I remember the notings on the file of Nehru, 3.47 lakhs. How can you give a state to them? It's not even a, enough as a small district uh, in Assam. You're giving a state, and how will they survive? You know, they don't have money, they don't have resources, and you are, you know, we are. And then we impose the entire Westminster model of mm. uh, the legislative assembly mm. and mm. so on. You know, literally bypassing the entire traditional count, village councils and the entire community structure which was there, and you impose this. Westminster model, creating a another set of elites uh, within the society in Naga society, and that created a lot of churning uh, within the society. So that is why sixty, you formed the agreement, and uh, literally days, uh, months after that, you were still a ceasefire because the violence never stopped. And then you had again another series of negotiations when Jay Prakash Narayan and uh, Pastor, who was then who was finally thrown out of India, also uh, they formed with Gundevia this whole series of negotiation to try and and finally those negotiations also broke down. It didn't succeed, and uh, then you had uh, violence going on till 1975 when you had again the uh, Shillong Accord. Right. When right. they got uh, weakened and they had the Shilling Accord, which again at that time, Muiwa and Kaplang and others were all in China at that time, and they said we don't agree th with the Shilling Accord, even though uh, that time the militant groups all came in, and uh, it created other problems, which repercussions of that are still felt uh, in the northeast. And just to cite one example, the Naga Hill districts was a district of Assam. Right. If you look at the neighboring Manipur, Manipur was a state and a kingdom before the British came. They had in 1947, Manipur had a constitution. Before India had a constitution, they had a constitution, Le elected legislatures with a king and so on. And in 60, uh, the district of Assam was made a state, and Manipur. Had to fight for the next 12 years till 1972. Only then they became a state. That created a lot of what shall I say, apprehensions among the the Maithis and the Manipuris, yeah. and you really encourage them. You said, okay, if you take up arms, that's the only way government of India listens to you. And I think that you encourage that by giving state to those who took up arms, to a small district, leaving aside this big state, which you finally gave first a union territory status, and then. The others to followed that example. Followed that example. As an average Indian, if you look at the Naga question in the Northeast, it's it's pretty complicated. There are several factions, and they have the, their separate demands. So, if you can summarize for us, what are the key factions within the Naga movement, and what, how exactly are they different from each other, and what are the main demands at this point of time? Just to understand, the, first you had this Naga NFG, the Naga Federal Government, right. which you know Fizo and that group entire. That is the one that split. Post the Shillong Accord, into the uh, what we call as the NSCN, first original, and then that split again into the Isaac Su Muiwa faction and the Kaplang faction. Right. These are the two, right. and then you have got this NNG or the NFG as a third faction, much quieter. The NSCN K itself, Kaplang group itself, has now split into two. But the dominant uh, force militarily within India, which took, uh, was actually the uh, NSCN IM. And because the 
Nagas are very what should I call tribe and clan conscious. These groups etc are the NSC and IM were actually if you see the bulk of the cadres were the, you know all top positions in one sense you want to call it the Brahmins in the NSC and IM are the Tankuls. Isaac Su was again a, a Sema who was a figurehead because he was part of the, right. that Sema and the tribe in Nagaland mm -hmm. whereas Tankuls are in Manipur. So the NSC and IM which became the most powerful group actually has no locus standi within the state of Nagaland because right, Isaac right, Su was right. uh, there but that was not. So uh, and the NSC and K had again different you know Mon, Konyaks and so on other tribes were more backing the Kaplan group which was closer to Myanmar on that side. So uh, you got these groups. The real breakthrough and I put it as a breakthrough because even though uh, you have not had a peace agreement. But the fact that in 1997 we were able to get uh, Muiva to ceasefire brought down the level of violence to an extent which you know the first 10 years after the ceasefire you did not have a single civilian being killed, mm. a single policeman being killed, a single army man being killed. Occasionally here and there two insurgent groups would possibly fight among themselves and one or two people would get killed. You had real peace and for the first time people in Nagaland, Kohima, Dimapur, etc. Uh, they could sleep in peace in that sense. So why is that from 2007 to 2015 for 8 long years no peace process actually progressed towards a, an agreement, a lasting agreement between the two sides. What was the situation when you were the Home Secretary when the UPA2 was in power? See 1997 to 2000 you know you had uh, first Swaraj Kaushal then Padmanabhaya was for 10 years as the. I think uh, my uh, impression because many of the years I was not there as back uh, back in the state. I was JS Northeast when the uh, ceasefire 97 right, to right, 2001. Right. I think the clear political uh, direction was not there. Plus, I think you needed time for things to settle down in the sense that uh, uh, f first, if you remember, the talks were all you know um, talks will be between the NSC and I M and the Prime Minister. It will be in, held in a third country and so on and so forth. And it required little time to bring uh, what I would call as the NSC and I am also to understand the realities of that uh, you are negotiating with a big country right. and uh, you are also realizing that there are so many other issues which are there and it needed to you needed time to what shall I say reality to sink in and come in. Uh, so, I think some time took place and I think there was, so in 2011 when we came we found that it had not really moved very much. Even though you know there was a group of ministers had been uh, tasked to meet along with the interlocutor and so on they went and talked and 2011 we actually uh, Mr. Padmanabhaya uh, left and we, ha we brought in um, Mr. Pandey, R.S. Pandey who was the former Chief Secretary of uh, because we felt he knew the uh, ground situation, he had credibility, he could take, sp speak in Nagamese and he could then. And I think between 2009 and 2011 we were able to, I would put it as 90 percent of the breakthrough in negotiations took place during that time. So uh, uh, almost I should say everything was on an agreement and it took time. Uh, I think the great uh, achievement during that time was persuading and getting the NSCIM to understand what we call as shared sovereignty. You know they kept saying Nagas are sovereign and we kept saying that a state is as sovereign as the central government because under the constitution you have list 1, you have list 2 and in list 2 which is the state subjects you are supreme. Not going by what uh, the government of India has done in JNK in now. JNK. Yeah. In JNK. So, that took a lot of time for them to understand. In fact, uh, the uh, NSCNIM actually brought uh, professors of law from Amsterdam and so on to come and study Indian constitution. Interesting. Come, they came and discussed with me. I forget the name of the professor now who came. And we have explained to him how in India there is a question of shared concept because in, your, in the state there are so many things which the state uh, government can do. Yeah, yeah. You can appoint a, the director general of police, you can appoint the police, you Chief can appoint Secretary. staff, you can dismiss them, you yeah. can hire them. These are all completely within your powers. 
you can you know shift during you can change districts and so on so, so i think he took a long time to understand studied had came and had discussions here with a lot of uh, professors of law and advocates and so on and i think he was able to, to finally i think persuade the ncnm that the shared sovereignty concept is what is uh, is in line with the naga objective of their sovereignty so what was the so you say that um, um, the, the modi government of course reached a draft agreement with the nagas in that is a framework agreement framework agreement in 2015 so much of the legwork was done by the upa government is that what you um, yeah i would say about 90% of the legwork was so done what was that what was the what was the content of that legwork as it were see the content was you know the the i'm asking this because we don't know what was the draft agreement that was uh, um, um signed between the two sides in 2015 see 2015 is only a framework agreement right but it didn't say know. it didn't say anything beyond saying that government of india accepts the unique history of the nagas it was very it was very important it's part of the our understanding uh to you know they fought for 60 70 years we said you have a unique history i mean it, it's in one sense nothing new because everybody has a unique history I mean, kerala has a unique right, history right. Uh, tamilians have a unique history right but nagas we said you have a unique history and an acknowledgement that you have a unique history and we said that issue of the shared sovereignty was there and that we understand certain f- basic features of that shared sovereignty i think that was the basic framework agreement but the substantive negotiations actually came one day nsc and im actually gave to us in upa 2 the 31 point memorandum of their demands which started with the constitution flag uh, all sorts of other other issues which came up including greater nagaland and so on and so forth so those got discussed in great detail so what were the things that you to agreed on the government of india and uh, the nsc and leaders see there were a lot of small issues see i think two things became very clear and i think the nsc and im understood one they realized that sovereignty in the sense of an independent country is out of the question they also realized i think that the issue of greater nagaland which was there in the you know in the 16 point agreement and so on and so forth is again something which is not possible for the government of india to give knowing the under the indian constitution right so those are two issues which once these two issues that the territorial integrity of the current states is not being touched and sovereignty issue is as we said we come into the shared sovereignty understanding then there were lot of other small issues which could be then discussed and negotiated i'll give you an example of i don't want to get into all the details of it there were number of subjects which are uh, shall i say in the concurrent list in the government of in the constitution of india where both center and state could right many of these uh, detailed discussion took place and many of these we are we really had no great objection in giving it over to the states we said you you can you can have it under your so it's part of additional sovereignty which you will get those subjects will come which is only a schedule for the nagaland and the constitution because you must remember there's already article 371a which came hmm. when the 16 point agreement was translated into the from the state of nagaland here article 371a which said nagas no law of parliament shall apply to the state unless uh, concurred by the state legislature it said you know customary laws will apply on in respect of their traditional ways of doing things etc and issues like uh, land forests including minerals which are below the land because like oil uh, which was always r- issue of royalty and uh, which again became a issue which we said is something which it's possible for us to give because not much by giving say oil exploration of oil to the nagaland government in consultation with ongc i mean it's not it's no big deal for the government of india so just to be clear so on the issue of uh, sovereignty there was absolutely no um, uh, flexibility on the indian side on the issue of change of uh, state borders um, uh, that's greater nagaland there was no flexibility on this side what was the indian government's reaction at that point of time to a separate constitution and a separate flag there's no question of separate flag because we already got the article 371a which would actually get expanded special constitutional provisions instead of a separate constitution you get a sep- you got a, you got the special constitutional provision for nagaland which would have got expanded so article 371a would got 
much deeper, what shall I say, much greater uh, emphasis in right. terms of subjects which would be dealt with by the, by the, by the Naga uh, land government. Right. And we also realized that this Naga Lem issue is something which is an emotional issue. Right. And therefore, uh, you need to, for the Nagas who are staying in different parts of in Nagas in Arunachal Pradesh, Nagas in Assam, Nagas in Manipur, etc. It is possible for us to have some sort of a, what you call as a quasi state body, multi state body, mm -hmm. which will look into what I call as, uh, you know, the cultural heritage, the tribal customs and so on and so forth of all Nagas. And that in one sense would be something like, uh, it is not Naga limb, but it gives a identity to one area where we are acknowledging that there are Nagas in different parts of uh, India, maybe even uh, in Myanmar. Yep. And uh, it is something which uh, uh, you'd be surprised that is actually unofficially the government of Nagaland actually helps Nagas in Myanmar by providing them assistance uh, <laughs> in different ways. Right. But that is part of, I mean, it's part of the uh, what I call as the Naga bonding, if you want so to call even, it. That so way. even during the negotiations, during your period as the Home Secretary, um, there was no agreement on the Indian side to give a separate constitution and a separate flag like it is in the case of Jammu and Kashmir. Because I am asking this question because that seems to be one of the major uh, stumbling blocks at this point of time um, in the negotiations between the government of India and the, um, the NSEN. Um, so, there was absolutely yeah, no, there is no… There was no this thing at all and I think this is again I think uh, what I call… You have to realize that uh, till the final negotiations come, nobody is willing to give up his any position. You know, when we had uh, negotiations with Mizoram, Lal, uh, Laldenga, till the last day he kept saying Mizoram is a sovereign country. And then only on the last day he said, I give up that and accept the statehood. So, that position is something which is a part of negotiation. Nobody gives up the right. As far as I know, in 2011, really two major issues were pending, only two major issues. One was what degree of autonomy would you give the Nagas in Manipur? Because NSC and I is, is their entire base is in, in Manipur, Manipur, not in Nagaland. That's right. You know, Muiva can stand for elections in Nagaland, he won't get, he'll lose the deposit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what element of autonomy you will give there? And the issue then became also of how the rehabilitation of you know, in terms of how many numbers of armed cadres are there and how would they be absorbed in, you know, your separate, separate BSF battalion or um, Assam Rifles battalion and so on. So, on the numbers and the type of agreement, some would be possibly just get a financial because they would not be fit uh, to uh, be in the battalion because you need a certain element of physical fitness and so on, those who are over age and otherwise. So, those would get a financial you know, package. Uh, and the rest would be then absorbed into these battalions. These are the two key issues which are outstanding. And even on the autonomous uh, autonomy in Manipur, uh, you came to almost agreement on almost all issues, except two issues which were really the stumbling block. And that became one of postings of collectors and SPs in the districts. And the state government of Manipur was very clear that that will be done by the state government. Because the collector and SP, that is the authority of the state. If that's we give right. that up, then we have no control over that. We were wanted that they should be allowed to, the district council should be able to post the collectors and SPs. Some agreement was trying to come saying that, you know, you will do it in consultation mm -hmm. with etc. But it was not, a, there was no agreement uh, at that point of view. But that was the real uh, stumbling block at that sense. And there is a element which you have to look at, I think, if from the Manipur point of view. When they are giving, if they are giving this autonomy to the uh, Naga tribes etc., they are also looking at they have to sell it to the Maithis and their people in the valley. Right. So, what is it that they are getting in return for? Right. If, if the Modi government in 2015 could have signed this um, um, agreement with um, the Nagas, why didn't the UPA government do that in 2014? If most, most of the negotiations were already finished. No, but you have to get every, every see one, one thing which the government of India realized that you cannot sign any more an agreement with any one party and ha expect that you will have a peace. And that is one thing which we were very clear of and which we so have told Muiva also that one, some issues are still outstanding 
I will come again to why the 2015 agreement was signed. The, if you see the history, you know, 60, you signed an agreement giving statehood, which was a, you know, revolutionary decision, which is actually the reason why all this problem came. Because if I had given only a union territory and they might have been happy at the uni with the union territory, today I could have negotiated and said, okay, now a union territory to a state. a state. Yes, it's a very graduated approach. Because it was with state, there is nothing more in the constitution, there is nothing more, there is no supra state, right. you know, which right. I can, I right. can give right. other than, you know, special provision in the constitution. So, we were very keen and very clear in the government of India that any agreement which we now sign with the Nagas will be not just with the NSC and IM with whom we are negotiating, but we will take this agreement, whether we take it, NSC and IM takes it, they take it to the people, they take it to the Naga Ho Ho, they take it to the Naga Students Federation, they take it to the state government, they take it to the NSC and K, etc. And everybody is on board. So, all, everybody will sign the Naga Peace Accord. It is not, you can't have with an NSC and IM agreement. Just one faction, yeah. So, uh, that was very, very clear. So, in that light, how do you evaluate the 2015 uh, framework agreement? The 2015 agreement, at least as far as I am concerned, it was done primarily because they wanted an agreement on what I call as a framework. It's a framework, right, yeah. no, there's no details of any of the things which I mentioned of uh, the, you know, what specific articles of the constitution in list one, which we already agreed upon. So, there is, so nothing in writing. There is, it's just a broad agreement, you know, it's a, it's like a MOU, you know, MOU sign, I agree to, I, ac I accept the unique history of the Nagas, uh, we share sovereignty between the two of us and we are, we will work together in the future, you know, sort of jointly and things like that. That is the framework agreement. So, so the difficult issues were not dealt with in that? In uh, that framework. agreement, because they, it had been dealt with in the negotiations. Right. But you can't have an agreement till everything is done. The 2015 agreement came and I think it was very clear that it is came about only because Isaac Sue was dying. And because Isaac Sue was dying and he was the, uh, what shall I say, the representative of the major, one major Naga tribe in Nagaland, they wanted an agreement which sort of bound part of the Sema tribe of Naga tribe also into this framework agreement because his agreement was signed in the, literally in the ICU, mm. in the hospital, right. his signature was taken there. So, uh, and then few months later he died. So, uh, now at least the NSC and IM have got a piece of paper which has Isaac Sue's signature, which sort of gives in this thing that we are still, it's not just a Muiva Thangkul Manipur group alone, but it's a across state boundaries, uh, there is an agreement, there's a larger issue which, which came. Coming back to the 2015 agreement, so how do you evaluate uh, what the Modi government has signed with uh, the uh, Naga rebels? Um, how useful is that uh, agreement um, given the fact that uh, it seems to have not really gone very much uh, uh, ahead as far as uh, the news reports are concerned? Yeah, but you must, as I told you, you must understand the background rather. The background was Isaac Sue's failing health. There is no other reason for signing a 2015 agreement but for the fact that NSAIM was extremely keen that and it was a good publicity for them. Right. Right? Prime Minister was there. Yeah. They Even for the Prime Minister it was a good Prime Minister publicity, publicity. You, as though you know the agreement, Naga agreement, peace, peace agreement was just round the corner. Right. It is not round the corner because there are lots of other mi minor issues as I said, the issue of autonomy in the hill districts of Assam. The, uh, agreement on the numbers, the rehabilitation, uh, you know, all these are issues which were still pending. And so, on the Manipur, they could never get an agreement because the Manipur government uh, was quite obstinate and firm that mm -hmm. we will not sign unless there is something for us. So, what is the state of negotiations at this point of time? Because the government of India had kept a deadline for October 31st, that has not been met. So, you had a, see, you had a whole series of discussions, consultations with various groups. The interlocutor, Mr. Ravi, has met widely with people both in Manipur, in, in Assam and so on. You have an advantage that you have now a BJP government in Manipur also. So, some of the, shall I say, the um, ticklish issues, uh, maybe uh, the Prime Minister will be able to persuade the Manipur government to agree to some, the autonomy aspects. But you will see, he will still have to concede some issues like on like the issue of say land see you you got a problem with you know you got 10% of the land which is owned by 50% of the people 
and the all the hill districts which are 70 percent of the you know, area, the Nagas have exclusive right to the land. So, you all the Nagas can go to the valley and buy land in Imphal and so on and so forth. But nobody from Imphal can go to the hill districts and buy land. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So, you got in right. a state people who are 40 percent of the people who have 70 percent of the land can buy in the other 30 percent, but the 30 percent who have already squeezed, they cannot buy even an inch of land in the other. So, land is a very sensitive emotional issue on both sides and then you have got the cookie, you know you have got the cookie, there is a districts which are uh, cookie dominated uh, next to Ukrul. So, you are you are looking at though how what sort of are they excluded from the Naga Hill districts are they part of the agreement what sort of autonomy will you give uh, you have got the issue of district of Churachandpur which is you know the Zomis and uh, you have got the Paites there you know, and the cookies so, what sort of autonomy will you give them along with that. So, there are you know other smil small minor issues which uh, need to be also settled and these are the, what I call as the stumbling blocks in today. Uh, but beyond say. those stumbling blocks, uh, Mr. Pillai, I mean, I saw the statement by the NSE and IN, uh, IM statement. It says that without these two core issues, which is uh, the uh, separate flag and constitution, um, any solution would be far from honorable because Naga's pride and identity is deeply entrenched here. So, how seriously do you take this statement that the NSC and IM is not going to sign a document? or a peace agreement unless and until these two issues are addressed. I do not think so. I think now I, I see I am not really uh, I am sure that a separate constitution is out of the question in so far as this government is concerned. That is right, but are, is, that a, is that a dominant demand from their side? It was always it was there, but as far as I see it by 2011 that, that demand had receded to the background, it is no longer. Issue of a flag, <coughs> see I am not uh, think it is a great deal. You can have a flag, Karnataka has got a separate flag, so you know, uh, you know it is not giving us somebody a separate flag, India is too big a country if, right. if Nagas have a flag, you know it is not going to make any great impact on, on the Indian issue. So, so the these are, those are negotiable yeah. issues. A separate constitution I think is out of the question which is because you have got this article 371A which is going to be expanded uh, right. substantially. I am, I am not, one thing which I am not very sure of is and I is because the details of the negotiations are is whether any of those issues which we had conceded during that time uh, has the Modi government gone back on that we do not I do not know that is right. I am not a party to that because I left uh, government 8 years ago and if some of the things have there has been a shall I say go back because of the ultra nationalistic this thing. Uh, th then you, you will have a problem because then they will say that look you considered you know you are going back. Do you think the uh, the decision of the government of India to read down article 370 and withdraw the special status um, of uh, that was given to Jammu and Kashmir that has somehow contributed to the breakdown of the talks between Nagas and the government of India uh, especially on the question of the separate constitution and the flag. Has it some, somehow uh, cautioned them that you cannot somehow negotiate with this particular government because look at what has happened in Jammu and Kashmir. You think that is that is a serious issue? See it is a matter of perception, it is a question of you know as I say you know when you are negotiating you are negotiating as equals in one sense you know you are they are part of as we call them they are part of India. So, you are really looking at issues of there has been violence for a long time, but now you do not have in fact last 20 years 1997 is 22 years where uh, you had a real ceasefire, no, no major violence here and there except occasional clashes. So, a new generation which has come up 22 years, you know, people who have been about 10 years old, they have not seen violence in their life, you know. So, you are, you are seeing a whole generation which is looking up, not the generation which was born in the 40s and 50s who grew up with violence, the violence and you know, families being killed and um, atrocities on either side and so on and so forth. So, it is a, so that change is taking place and many of them have in uh, what I call as many of the Nagas have voted with their feet. Uh, look at the Nagas who are now in parts of all over India. I think there are about 10,000 uh, Tankul Nagas in Delhi alone. They run a football tournament in Delhi, you know, right, all, yeah, all teams yeah, yeah. among <laughs> themselves. That many numbers are here and they are in different parts of India. They have 
they have come into fashion designing, they are in culture, they are in government service, they are in you know music and um, all sorts of things. So, people have gone abroad. So, it is a they have for them India has been a great opportunity you know by coming into the rest of India they have uh, you know the pressure right. that jobs were not there right. has been felt less and it also to an extent that you are not getting recruits for the insurgent movement there because the youngsters are all migrating and getting uh, different types of uh, entrepreneurial jobs. They are running restaurants, they are uh, fashion designing, um, hospitality industry, uh, they are doing uh, quite well. How involved are some of the uh, neighboring countries um, as far as the uh, insurgency, Naga insurgency is concerned in the Northeast? I mean, earlier there used to be a lot of talk about Myanmar, um, China, etc. So, how involved are they in the recent past? Well, China has always been, they got first, they all their tra the initial training was in China, Moiva and the whole, one whole group they had. I think they ran into problems primarily because of uh, the Christian, Christian issue and mm -hmm. And the Nagas being Christians, they did not, you know, that atheism and the uh, Communist Party right. allegiance was right. something which it did not gel too much. They had little support from the Myanmar army, which is again, you know, it's, you stay in a, in another country, you are getting, you know, base camps and then their payoffs and protection money is there. Myanmar to an extent now is slightly, our relations also has improved with the Myanmar government, so they have less. Uh, support, in fact, even on the uh, Kaplang camp and the Parish Barua, seeing all of them have been most major camp got attacked by the Myanmar army. So there's a they, many of them. Parish Barua has now gone back to China to. For the Chinese, it's it shall I say, it's something which they can. It's a nuisance value they can always play. If things break down. So, how, but how involved is China at this point of time? Not much. Very little, except that. Uh, you arms arms can still smuggling still comes from there. I think they they still give safe sanctuary. Uh, you know they know people some of the militant groups will come, and many of them come to get arms and uh, you know traffic uh, money and arms and so on. So this is part of it which is always there. And this is my last question. What's your prognosis of what might happen now, given that the 30, 31st uh, October deadline that the government of India set for itself uh, is long past? See the 31st October deadline, I don't know why they fixed it because you can't set any deadline. It is, it is, it it's is a negotiation. You know, it, it's not, it's a negotiation. You have to find uh, this thing. Is. Maybe I think it was just as a, it's again what you call a negotiating uh, tactics, you know. You want everybody to come out and say that, look, where, where do you stand? And to an extent, to that extent, you saw a lot of people who are willing to say, yes, we don't want a breakdown of the ceasefire. So that is there. And for Muiva himself uh, in uh, Nagaland itself, there is a lot of what I call as uh, consultations and uh, steps for forgiveness that he has to do. There are still areas in Nagaland where uh, Muiva is a persona non grata because he has killed, NSC and IM have killed, you know, very, uh, shall I say, certain tribes, he has killed their leaders and they, do, they don't forget. Right. Uh, so, he can't enter some of those villages uh, because his life is not secure. Mm. So, at some point of time, he will have to also say, uh, I think he has done something extremely useful that he is, and all Nagas to an extent appreciate, that he has brought the negotiations to the government of India level at a, you know, one to one level and the Nagas are very right. appreciative of that. He has now to, he has had a, a set of demands which had the backing of a lot of people. He has to say, I have negotiated this, this is the best that I could negotiate. Go back and say, I think this is a good deal and I think he will, um, most of the Naga groups will back him mm. with that deal because they think that what he has got is the best deal possible. And he has to also say that, uh, yes, in the past uh, certain mistakes have been committed by me to my own people and I am sorry for that. And apologize for that and appeal for forgiveness and so on. It is part of that custom. Right. You know, the uh, Naga people, I am one of the great admirers of the Naga people. I think it is, uh, uh, they are a very wonderful people. I mean, I think uh, you would not get better friends than uh, if you had a Naga friend. Interesting. <laughs> Mr. Pillai, wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button 
and hit the bell icon pay to support independent journalism click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay